going to begin this morning from the book of Alma. In chapter 16, we find Alma telling a story about a a gentleman by the name of Korhor who has, for all intents and purposes, demanded a sign from the Lord that if he cannot somehow invoke his eyes, that somehow the Lord does not exist. Alma, in his frustration, striving to work with Korahor, it's Alma 16, I'm sorry, begins to uh, share with him, you know, why are you tempting the Lord your God? Korahor continues, and so Alma places a curse upon him, and he has become dumb and cannot speak. And yet, when Korahor finally reaches to the point where deep within his soul he realizes the truth, he desires to speak, and the Lord grants him that opportunity. And yet, that opportunity passes so quickly Because still within his heart, he desires a sign from the Lord. And so the Lord calls him home that he might know the truth. Later in chapter 16 of Alma, we find these words in verse 149. Now, as I said concerning faith, that it was not a perfect knowledge, even so it is with my words. Ye cannot know of their surety at first unto perfection any more than faith is a perfect knowledge. But behold, if you will awake and arouse your faculties even to an experiment upon my words and exercise a particle of faith, yea, even if ye can no more than desire to believe, let that desire work in you even until you believe in a manner that ye can give place for a portion of my words." I want to take the time to thank Amy for her uh, beautiful music. Uh, I've had an honor and a privilege these past few years to work with your father and to get to know your family uh, through his thoughts and through his mind. And I can tell you that uh, you are most certainly very precious to your father. To this... uh, motley crew here on my left I uh, I am truly a blessed man because I have the opportunity to uh, live a life which allows me to listen to those angelic voices as often as my heart desires music is very much part of the Coney culture and uh, from our father who uh, isn't with us Uh, listening to him uh, play the guitar and teach us songs like Six Little Ducks and uh, then taking upon himself to learn campfire songs. Music is very much a part of our family. The subject of faith can oftentimes be a challenging one because we are very limited in our exposure to the gospel we desire so much to be able to look out and use our eyes and to see and therefore put away all doubt. And yet the Lord in his wisdom uses subtlety to prick our conscience. Those things which we feel, the things which we hear, oftentimes even the things which we taste, and even the things that we smell. Throughout our lives, if I were to ask you about your childhood, some of the things that would come to mind, yes, are things that we see. But the things of most importance are oftentimes the things that we don't see. It's the things that we smell, the things that we taste, the things that we feel, such as going to grandmother's house for Thanksgiving 
and enjoying a wonderfully cooked turkey, a ham, mashed potatoes and gravy, stuffing, her homemade pumpkin pie. These memories are what help to shape and define us. And as I think back over my life, there are certain experiences that I've had that really did not lean upon those things which I see, but those things which I feel, those things which I have heard, especially in my youth when it came to church camp, retreats, visiting Palmyra, visiting the Kirtland Temple. So this morning we're going to talk about this journey that the scriptures spend so much time talking about, this journey from going from hope to faith, from faith to knowledge and understanding. And hopefully we're smart enough to realize the journey just doesn't end there. But we are asked by our Heavenly Father to continue that journey unto wisdom and intelligence. So to begin with, we'll go to a familiar scripture in Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 1. A very simple scripture, which at times, especially in moments of trial, and our faith is being tested. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I remember as a young man when we would uh, go to our English classes and the teacher would ask us to define a word. If we defined it using the very word in the very definition, we were chastised. How can you define a word by using that word in and of itself? So when I take a look at a definition of faith and the word hope appears, I kind of think of, you know, well, maybe we need to start with hope and find out what hope truly is. So as we oftentimes do, you go to your computer and you go to Google, because Google knows everything. One of the definitions that comes up from Merriam-Webster is hope is to want something to happen or to be true. <clears throat> to think that it could happen or be true. And that's most certainly a suitable one. However, there are a very collected work in, in Wikipedia, and sometimes people get very enthusiastic in their definitions and their work in Wikipedia, and I couldn't help it. But Wikipedia defines hope as an optimistic attitude of mind based on an expectation of positive outcomes related to events and circumstances in one's life or the world at large. I, I tend to like that definition a lot. A, a positive outlook that something that you anticipate will actually happen. And each and every day we get up, we throw the covers off, we swing our feet out of the bed. And from that very moment, we either have a positive outlook on the remainder of our day or we're not. And when we wake up with the wrong attitude, oftentimes we get to work and we have a situation with a coworker. And what does that coworker do? I wonder what side of the bed they woke up on this morning. My family enjoyed going to Bad Lake, Minnesota in our childhood. We had friends that owned a cabin up there. And I don't know how many summers we must have spent vacationing at Battle Lake. But this particular summer, the entire Tucker family was going to be going up there. And since we were so close with the Tuckers, they invited us to come with them. And so mom and dad packed up and Charity and I had the privilege of going up and spending uh, several days with the Tucker family. And in the lake, 
you, you could walk out probably a half mile into the lake before the water ever went above your chin. It was just absolutely pristine and beautiful. You could see the bottom of the lake, not like some of the lakes we have around here, like Lake Chicomo. But the adults gathered together to play some water volleyball, and as is often the case, when your hand gets wet, things get slippery, and when things get cold, your finger shrinks, and my dad's ring flew. After they had finished their uh, game of water volleyball, uh, they're gathering back together and heading back to the cabins when all of a sudden somebody realizes, Jim, where's your ring? And he looks down and he's like, uh, I have no idea. It must have come off while we are playing volleyball. So all the adults decide to go back down and they're starting to look for dad's ring and they're not finding it. Now, ironically, because of all the volleyball playing, all the water's murky, it's been kicked up, sediment is everywhere, so you can't see the bottom anymore. And in the midst of despair, they finally realize, you know what, until the water settles, we're really not going to see anything. So they go ahead and they go back to the cabins. We have dinner. Uh, most of the adults scatter. Some have to go to town to get groceries. Uh, more supplies. Uh, some of them are, are heading out for their evening uh, fishing. And one of the mothers gathered up all of us kids. And she said, what we're going to do this evening is we're going to offer prayer. And then we're going to go back into the lake. Sun's about to head over the horizon, so we don't have a lot of time. So she gathered us together. We offered prayer. And us kids began creeping our way into the area where the adults were playing volleyball. And we were walking around, trying to look into the water, see the bottom. And our biggest fear was we would never see it because the sediment had covered up the ring. One of the uh, older ladies who was, um, I was a kid, so to me she would have been an older lady. She was a senior in high school, so <clears throat> take it for what it is. She looks down and sitting right on top of the sediment without anything covering it at all is my father's ring. As she reaches down, she picks up that ring. She goes, I found it. All because one mother believed with all her heart. She hoped with all her heart, that if we did this simple act, the Lord would be generous and return into my father's wedding ring. I was completely stunned. Uh, I, I remember plenty of instances where we've lost things in the house and people go crazy trying to find it. And then after infuriating several days, mom would simply say, well, have you prayed about it? Well, no. Why would we pray about it? We lost it. We'll find it. But moms have a tendency to know best. So there we were, ring found. We couldn't wait for Dad to get back from his fishing trip so we could share it with him. Hope is the very beginning. If we desire something to come true, if we want to know that something is true, if we have an expectation, it begins with hope. For 13 years, our parents hope that our little gray mass of goo collects enough information that one day we can pass our exams and be bestowed the honor of high school graduates. They don't ever give up in that hope. That's why every time when I would wake up, I don't want to go to school. No, you're going to school. For most people, let's just hope it's a 13-year adventure. For me, it was a little longer than that. But each and every day, 
as much as I did not want to go to school, my parents hoped that I would learn just enough information to make it another day. That after 13 years, they would have the privilege of sitting in the auditorium and watching their son walk across the stage and be declared a graduate. But hope is not enough. The Lord hasn't asked us to pitch a tent and camp out on hope. Hope is the beginning. In 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 7, it's a very short sentence. We walk by faith. In Hebrews, we read that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's one step further in the process, we go from hoping something is to having confidence that something is. We trust that it will happen. Merriam-Webster defines faith as strong belief or trust in someone or something. Our enthusiastic friends at Wikipedia say, faith is confidence or trust in a person, thing, deity, view, or in the doctrines or teachings of a religion. To have faith in something that you cannot see is extraordinary power. There's a confidence and a trust with faith that doesn't necessarily exist with hope. You can still have doubts, you can still have fears and anxiety with hope. But the point is, with hope, you're still moving forward. You want it to be true. You will pursue that endeavor, even though you're still racked with doubt. Faith crosses over doubt. When that doubt melts away, we have found ourselves with faith. We had the uh, privilege... I want to say it was 91. Charity and I and, and uh, Jeff behind me had the privilege of going on a, a caravan to Palmyra, New York. Dan and Darcy Brotherton, who we had grown to love and trust as youth counselors, uh, through uh, RCI, we spent a lot of time together and one of their heart's desire was we want to get a group of kids together and we want to zigzag through the restoration branch from Missouri to Illinois to Ohio all the way up to Palmyra. And we want to take these kids to see the uh, Mormon pageant. And we were excited because the year before we went on caravan with them, we were able to go see Nauvoo, uh, went to the I believe we went to the Kirtland Temple. That may have been the Palmyra trip. But we spent quite a bit of time in Aurora, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. And through those experiences, when they announced that they were going to Palmyra that year, we couldn't wait. An opportunity to see the grove where Joseph Smith had got down upon his knees and where the whole restoration began. So we began making preparations for this trip. We pulled into the area there in Palmyra, went to the visitor center, went up to the hill where the plates were found, had opportunity to go see the grove. And that evening, we came back. And on the side of the hill, the Mormons put on the pageant of the Book of Mormon. And every story in the Book of Mormon is laid out to view in story form. And I remember as a youth group, we, we lined up there in the seats, and I was sitting next to Angela at the time, and at the end of every scene, I would stop and I would look at Angela, is that in the Book of Mormon? Yes, James, it's in the Book of Mormon. The next scene, it would come to an end, that was in the Book of Mormon? I'm sure at this point she's beginning to get frustrated, haven't you read the Book of Mormon? Sorry, I'm an athlete. I play soccer nonstop. 
Haven't had time to read it. But scene after scene after scene, as I'm hearing stories that I have learned in the Book of Mormon while sitting on my mother's knee, while learning new stories that I hadn't seen or heard before, my heart began to change. I began to realize, you know what, this is kind of embarrassing that I claim to be a part of a heritage and I don't know what that heritage is. And so as my heart began to soften, I began to ask within myself, you know, everybody I know has a powerful testimony of the Book of Mormon. I don't even know half the stories in it. So I began to desire and expect that I would come to that conclusion, that the Lord would have his moment with me that I would know. Halfway through, they have a bunch of sets to move, and there's an intermission, and we, we're starting to talk, and poor Angela is sharing her frustration with me. You know, this would be far more enjoyable if you would stop interrupting every other act. Okay. So for the next half, I'm watching story after story, the coming of Christ, the land going dark, people wandering in fear for three days, and then he descends. Now, I did not notice all the wiring harnesses and everything that lit up the sky until the focus came. And there was this gentleman dressed as Christ, and the spotlight shined upon him, and he descended. And the power of the Lord came over me in a way I had never felt before in my life. So I knew something was about to happen. And we went through that the rest of the second act, story after story, and it just kept building, and it kept growing. And I stopped hoping. I pretty much knew at that point something was about to happen, but I didn't know what. The play had come to its conclusion. We gathered back on the bus, and we started going back to the campground. And as youth do, we start singing campfire songs, one right after another. And the power of God came over me in a way that... I was even greater than before. And I simply asked a simple question. Lord, is that which I have seen true? And just as if he was standing right here, as plainly as I am talking to you, I heard a voice. That which you have seen is as real as I am. And it was at that moment I felt such power, it became undeniable. And I could no longer contain it. I rose from my seat. When the song had concluded, I bore testimony to everyone on that bus. And I sat back down. Jared Hawley was sitting in the seat in front of me. Back then, we were just two young kids, didn't know a whole lot. Today, we're brother-in-laws. But Jared turned around. He looks at me. He goes, did I hear you correctly? Did you just receive your testimony of the Book of Mormon? I said, yes, I did. And from that moment on, not once have I ever doubted the truth of the book. But this, this is what excites me more than anything. It wasn't just a testimony of the book. It was a testimony of my Lord and Savior. No more a doubt as to whether or not he was real. No longer a doubt that he had died for me. My Savior himself came to me as plainly as I'm speaking to you. That which you have seen is as real as I am. And I had, in one single moment, transitioned from hope to faith, to a knowledge.
as I began looking up a good definition for knowledge, smack dab in the middle of the definition is the word understanding. Well, it's kind of hard to preach a sermon that knowledge comes before understanding when understanding is in the very definition. So I went to understanding, and in the middle of the definition is knowledge. So since I didn't like what Wikipedia and Webster had to say, I had to rephrase it myself. Knowledge is a familiarity and awareness or information about someone or something. In my profession, I'm a precision tool and cutter grinder. All the things that are made for man to use in his daily walk has to be made by something. And those cutting tools, which all things are created from, I build. I'm not the only one who does it, I'm not gonna to pretend to be. But there are very, very few left on this earth who actually do this as a profession. And I learned it all from my father in the family business. So there are a lot of things about manufacturing and how all the implements that we use in life are made. From the vehicles that we drive to the automobiles, plastic folding chairs, pencils, the whole nine yards. But the interesting thing is, is as I began learning this profession from my father, in the beginning, I didn't have a clue as to what I was learning. I had no understanding whatsoever. Great, I can look at this chart and it will tell me what angles to put on this particular cutter so it will function. But my understanding just isn't there. So over time, with experience, that understanding begins to come. Understanding is the ability to comprehend, to have insight, to use good judgment, interpretation, discernment. When you understand something, you can evaluate it and say, you know, if I did it this way, this is gonna cause pain and suffering. But if I do it this way, we'll actually obtain the result that we want. I have somewhat of an embarrassing story. Dad and I will just say we have a unique relationship. Uh, Dad's no longer with us. We laid him to rest in 09. But as I was growing in my knowledge and understanding of the family business, we came to a point where we were just clashing. And that relationship was really being tested we had a client who had received a contract from NASCAR to make some gears. And so the only people they knew of that could make the tools that they needed was Coney Tools. So they called us up. We said, sure, we can take care of this. And I started making these cutters so they could make the gears necessary for NASCAR. And I programmed the tools, I qualified my machine, I, I made sure all my T's were crossed, all my dies were dotted, were dotted. And I put that first blank in the machine, cycle start, hour later the, machine, the tool comes out of the machine at it, and it is all over the place. What did I do wrong? I don't understand. I stick the next one in there, I'd make a bunch of offsets so my diameters would come out, my lengths would come out, my angles would be accurate, my radiuses would be true, and it should be perfect. It comes out, it's wrong. In the midst of my frustration, I kept throwing blank after blank after blank because sooner or later, it has to magically become right. Dad comes downstairs from the office. I've got 12 bad tools. We only need six good ones, and he is livid. 
Now, in a father and son business, there's a big difference between talking to your son versus talking to your employee. And sometimes dads can't tell the difference between their son and their employee. So when things are great, I'm a wonderful employee. But when things aren't great, I'm his son. And corporate rules no longer apply, and I'm run through the mud. So the argument ensues. We go up into his office. We argue for more. And then he says, get downstairs and get it done right. Yes, sir. So I go back downstairs. I start, and they're still bad. Run right after another. I must have gone through 24 blanks at this point. Dad comes downstairs, and I kid you not, when you're this angry, you will do whatever is necessary to end the argument. All I wanted was Dad out of the business, in his own little world, so I could focus on what I needed to do. And so, much to my shame and humiliation, I picked up six of the best bad tools I could find. And I gave it to him. And he drives all the way to Lee Summit from Independence. And I'm thinking, oh, finally. The stress is gone, I can focus, and we can get down to business. It never occurred to me that my dad would walk into that business, hand the guy a tool he's supposed to be proud of, and it not look anything like what they want. The president of the company looks at my dad, and he's kind of he's got that I can't believe this look, and dad just hangs his head in shame. And he goes, I will take care of this. You will have your tools in the morning. Dad came back to the shop. Oh, the gauntlet. So dad looks at me very sternly, and he says, we're going to stop right here, right now. We're going to shut down for the day. We're going to go our separate ways. We're going to breathe. We're going to relax, spend some time with our spouses. And when we get up in the morning... We're going to requalify the machine, set up the probe, the wheel packs. You're going to reprogram that machine, and we're going to start this all over from scratch. Yes, sir. And then he begins to share with me, as he should have, because I had earned it. Whose name's on that door? It's your name. He goes, yes, it is. He goes, I built this company by my hands, the sweat of my brow from the ground up. And you delivered a product that lacked an integrity. Now, is the president of that company thinking ill of me? No, he doesn't know me. But my actions and that man's eyes destroyed my father's reputation. And I knew I had crushed my dad. So I get up the next morning. I couldn't sleep a whole lot, so I went in early. And I got the machine programmed. I requalified, set up the probe, the wheel packs. Everything was ready to go. Dad said, when that tool's done, let's talk. I said, okay. I put the blank in, cycle start, pulled it out, put it on our inspection equipment. Perfect. Every diameter, every length, every angle, every radius. I don't understand. What did I miss? I go and I get dad. He comes back. He looks at it. Perfect. What did you do? I don't know what I did. I have no explanation for this whatsoever. He goes, well, let's hurry up and get this job out of here so we can put this behind us. So I started going through one by one, and we knocked out the rest of those tools. Sent them to the client. Client was happy. NASCAR was happy. I was very grateful they decided to go ahead and pay their bill, even though we lost them as a client. But for weeks, Dad and I, just like this, 
And every time something happened, it would go right back to that same argument. Until the day dad blew his top, you're fired. (gasps) What am I going to do? I just married this beautiful lady. Our insurance is through the family business, not hers. I just finished making a covenant with her, promised to her father that I would take care of her. I drove home. I was beside myself, threw myself on the bed and cried. About 20 minutes later, there's a panicky knock at the door, and I open it, and my dad's on his knees. He's in tears. He goes, it took all of five minutes for me to realize you're the only one in this business who knows to run out that machine. So what are we going to do about this? I can't work with you. You can't work with me. So dad and I had to sit down and define the rules in this new relationship. And the very next day, I go right back to work. A few weeks later, we got an invitation in the mail to come to a seminar at IMTS. It's the world's largest manufacturing trade show. It's in Chicago. It's every other year. And the subject of this discussion was going to be over thermal dynamics. Dad and I looked at each other and said, do you think thermal dynamics had something to do with what we were experiencing? Sounds like it to me, so let's go. So we flew up to uh, Chicago, attended this seminar, and the doctor who was talking about the laws of thermal dynamics specific to grinding cutting tools had begun to explain to us that over time, you're dramatically increasing the temperature of your coolant. So when this seminar had completely ended, we had information on who to contact if we needed a cooler, and all the information we needed to determine if we had a cooling problem. And the very next day, we show up at work, we stick a thermometer in the coolant, it's a perfect 70 degrees. At the end of one entire day of work, it's over 140 degrees. What does that mean? It means my grinding wheel just grew 120 thousandths. And no matter what I do, it will not cut true. It was exactly the problem Dad and I were facing. All because we did not have the right knowledge and the right understanding to accomplish the tasks we were set out to do. We kind of had to take that in. And both of us, from our various perspectives, had to come back and rebuild this relationship. And it wasn't easy. It wasn't like all of a sudden, mystically, Dad and I stopped arguing. We still had our issues. But because of a lack of understanding, a lack of the right knowledge for the right task, it nearly destroyed our relationship. But is that the end of our journey? No, no, it's not. We have been asked in Scripture to continue that journey. It's not enough to simply know something and to understand it. We're required to display wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to think and act using knowledge, experience, understanding, common sense, and insight. The reason why when we are grandchildren, we hold our grandparents up in such admiration is because they display wisdom. And why do they display wisdom? Because they've been through the ropes. They've tripped and fall. They've picked themselves up. They learned. They grew. And from that knowledge and experience, that understanding, they realize before they engage in whatever activity, there are certain things you do not do. And yet there are certain things that you have to do or you will not know success. 
and we look at our grandparents and we're amazed. In section 90, I had to read this one multiple times because it, this one kind of surprised me. Section 90, verse 5. Man was also in the beginning with God. Intelligence, or the light of truth, was not created or made, neither indeed can be. All truth is independent in that sphere in which God has placed it, to act for itself, as all intelligence also. Otherwise, there is no existence. Behold, here is the agency of man, and here is the condemnation of man, because that which was from the beginning is plainly manifest unto them, and they receive not the light. And every man whose spirit receiveth not the light is under condemnation, for man is spirit. The elements are eternal, and spirit and element inseparably connected receive a fullness of joy. And when separated, man cannot receive a fullness of joy. The elements are the tabernacle of God. Yea, man is the tabernacle of God, even temples. And whatsoever temple is defiled, God shall destroy that temple. The glory of God is intelligence. Or in other words, light and truth. And light and truth forsaketh the evil one. If hope is the beginning, then intelligence is our destination. And we would define intelligence as one's capacity for logic, abstract thought, understanding, self-awareness, communication, learning, knowledge, memory, planning, creativity, and problem solving. The ability to use the vast expanse of all of our experience for what purpose? For the betterment of our family, the betterment of our congregation, the betterment of the body of Christ. I had an opportunity my uh, sophomore year in high school. I had signed up for geometry. Your sophomore year is the earliest you're going to take geometry at Truman back in that time. And I showed up, it was sixth hour, and there are roughly 42 kids in the classroom. Way too many kids for the number of chairs. Some of us were sitting on the bookcases in the back and on the side. And when Mr. Drinkwater had walked in, he's looking at this, and obviously somebody had made a mistake. So he goes ahead and gets the class started. He makes the call with the intercom system to the office to have the principal come. When he shows up, he realizes, wow, we've made a mistake. So they go to ask one of the other teachers if she can, since sixth hour is her time to grade papers, do whatever she needs to do, make phone calls, it's her personal time, if she would be willing to take a handful of these kids and teach geometry. And she said she would. Mrs. Latimer uh, taught my uh, Algebra One class and there was I, I was a little anxious to be chosen to be one of those few that was pulled out because I knew Mrs. Latimer, she didn't teach geometry. She's never taught geometry, even though she's taught algebra. And yet at the same time, I knew who my teacher was and I liked her very much. So we began in class and she's, she gets the book out and she has to read the book, find out what's going on, and then turn and look at the class and say, these are the principles 
for this chapter. And it was very frustrating in the beginning. Because you have a teacher who doesn't teach the subject, who has to learn it herself to pass that information on. And so she's going through and establishing all the definitions, informing us that we're going to learn postulates, theorems, and corollaries. And I'm excited because I live for math. But the rest of the kids aren't. Several weeks into it, our weighted grade for the class is a D. And she pulls me aside one day. She goes, I'm frustrated. I don't know what to do. Am I doing a good job? And I'm like, Mrs. Latimer, according to what I'm getting, yes, you're doing a great job. I mean, I've got an A. I... So she goes, well, tomorrow you're going to teach the class. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm a sophomore. Everyone else is a junior and senior. This ain't going to work. She goes, no, tomorrow you're teaching the class. I said, all right. So we show up for class. And I said, Mrs. Latimer, I hope you don't mind, but we're going to set the textbook aside. And I said, how many of you go to church? Everybody raised their hand. I said, do you believe in the principles of faith, repentance, and baptism? Yeah, sure we do. We're all Christians here. You know that. I said, okay. What do we spend the majority of our life frustrated over? Is it not the higher principles of life we struggle with, but we seem so readily able to accept faith, repentance, and baptism? Like, yeah. I said, these definitions Mrs. Latimer has taught us are nothing more than simple principles of faith, repentance, and baptism. And you're so scared of all these higher order principles that you've completely missed it. So let's start at the beginning. And so I went back and I redefined those exact definitions. Because this is how geometry works. Everybody gets terrified when I say sine, cosine, and tangent. The brain shuts off. I live this every day of my life. So you have all these higher order principles. And we're stuck with these. And we can't get past it. I said, so, this is what you need to know. All these principles up here, we can prove day in and day out. We can't prove that these exist. But we've defined them. If you can accept these principles on faith, everything up here will fall into place. So indirectly, if you can prove the existence of all these principles up here, they indirectly prove the existence of these principles down here. Does that make sense? Well, sure, if you explain it that way. So over the next several weeks, our class weighted average went from a D to a B. Because you have to understand that not everything in life is so easily provable. There are a lot in life we can't explain. We can't prove. We have to accept by faith that these things are true. And I promise you, every airplane that has ever flown since the Orville and Wilbur, right, is built upon principles based on geometry with these higher order principles and that entire system of mathematics is based on faith. Principles you can't prove but have to be true because all these things up here are true. It is my sincere desire and hope that as you continue throughout your day and as the children head off to uh, the various camps today and the upcoming weeks, that we will continue to allow that faith in our Lord and Savior to grow and one day surrender and give way to knowledge, that we will continue that journey unto intelligence. Thank you.